My first trip to Paris was on Christmas Day of 1971. I was fed up with hippies going nowhere, wanted to do something significant, decided on a wartime report from Belfast, bringing along someone who had already been there, a bourgeois gay artist. He'd get me through the parts where nobody spoke English, show me how to get around, see the essentials and yet stay out of trouble. Ready, I'd head off to Belfast on my own. It was so cheap in those days you could get to Amsterdam for a hundred round trip because so many hippies had gotten stranded over there they wouldn't sell one-way tickets anymore. To start things well, I got free passes to the San Francisco Opera production of Nutcracker Suite on Christmas Eve and in the morning we hit the airport. Landing in short order in Amsterdam, short visit of cafes and hippie bars like the Cosmos where the smoke is so thick that you can't see the walls and it's so potent that you think you can. We hitched to Paris and were picked up by friendly hippies who already had a few riders, which had us worried about crossing the border customs, but we got through fine and landed in a suburb called Vincennes. We struck off on our own to Paris, on the path of the beat poets. We found a room on Rue de Seine just across from the legendary beat hotel where Ginsburg, Kerouac, Snyder, and all the legends used to stay. Because, But our room was nicer. First floor, blue flowered wallpaper, iron bed and a wood stove for heat. Winter in Paris, but not too cold. Spot in the middle of the Marais, a fine old building awaiting refurbishment, where we camped in marginal legality, because the French can't put you out in, in the cold in the winter. My friend's familiarity with the town and cultural scenes made it far more interesting and accessible than it would have been wandering around without a clue. We explored the Latin Quarter, the artist studios of Montmartre and Montparnasse, the university campuses of Paris and Vincennes participated in various demonstrations and rebellions, met double national student leader Danny the Red, Cohn Bendit, now a respectable European deputy. Uh, we met Isadora Duncan's brother, who was teaching pottery and weaving just down the street from us. I met Soviet transfuge Rudolf Nerea, who invited me and a guest to watch him dance Petrushka. We met Jean-Paul Sartre and Simon de Beauvoir at uh, St. Germain's du Mago. Gertrude Stein, who was living just two blocks, rolled at Beaux-Arts near Oscar Wilde's favorite hotel. And Jesse would, would come along for sketching seances with uh, live models on Sunday. We were free to artists met more on known poets, blues singers, and jazz men at Shakespeare's bookshop near Notre Dame. It was first founded on Rue Monsieur de Prince by Sylvia Beach, first published Dylan Thomas. And it turned into such a neat trip I had a hard time reminding myself to tear away and get on with the reporting, which is, of course, another story. I did London, did Belfast, did London Dairy, back to London, and a great rock festival in Leicester, then stopped off in Paris on my way back to San Francisco to write my story. All I wanted to do was get back to Paris, so I worked for a few months on a construction job to save up the airfare, grabbed my son Jesse, and went back, staying at first with a, a band of hippies in the squat on Rue Temple in the Marais, and then back to Vincennes when a friend had left us his apartment so I could even put Jesse into kindergarten there. My friend got fed up with the starving bohème in Paris number, returned to the States, leaving us high and dry, waiting for occasional checks from old jobs, which eventually came through. I got hired for some album photos by a guitar-toting singer lady who was hitching south to Toulouse to stay with an engineer cousin who was working on the new Concorde supersonic jet. Jesse and I continued on to Marseille, where we had an address for a compatriot, my gay friend's sister, and they transferred us to Calas for a totally immersion French lesson 